In the mid-30s, the banner of motor racing supremacy passes from Italy to Germany. Mercedes and Auto Union dominate the scene and become the most powerful cars ever raced. Those who drive them are titans among men. The French Grand Prix at Montlhéry and an auto union is in the lead. In the forlorn hope of slowing down the silver German cars, the French have put chicanes in the straights. However, the only serious competition to Germany comes from the red Italian cars that have been winning for so many past years. But the high-built Alfa Romeos already look old-fashioned alongside the new Mercedes. All these Grand Prix cars are restricted by a formula to a weight of 750 kilograms. But with brilliant engineering and design, the Germans have already reached 430 horsepower. Mercedes are two laps ahead of anyone else. The winner, the great German driver, Rudi Caracciola. The German Grand Prix on the Nürburgring seems a certain German victory. The cameramen dwell lovingly on the silver cars that are the pride of Hitler Germany. The latest Mercedes are capable of 180 miles an hour, and even the most experienced drivers cannot yet make full use of such power. The more unorthodox auto unions with their engines behind the driver are the most difficult to master. Faced with the cars of the future, the cameramen ignore a high-built Alfa Romeo until it wins, driven by the fabulous Nuvolari. This, however, is the rare stroke of genius. Mercedes have won all but two races, and the champion of Europe is Caracciola. In the Monaco Grand Prix, Caracciola starts alongside Nuvolari in a brand new Alfa. Mercedes have taken on Louis Chiron, and he's also up at the front. Caracciola and Nuvolari are soon way out on their own. Chiron has piled up on a patch of oil. The scrap between Caracciola and Nuvolari is motor racing at its best. Rain like this isn't everyone's cup of tea. But Caracciola laps it up, and when it rains harder, he's never challenged. Nuvolari is dropping back while the auto unions, now with 500 horsepower, are still difficult to handle. Caracciola crosses the line and shows that he is still rain master. This year it rains on the Nürburgring for the Eiffel Rennen. Caracciola and Nuvolari are out in front, but this time the Mercedes isn't getting away. The Mercedes are shorter this year, and on this fast circuit they don't handle well. Caracciola is out, and it is clear that Mercedes are on the way to defeat. Nuvolari leads, but an auto union has come right on his tail. At last, someone has really got the feel of these cars. It's young Bernd Rosemeyer, who used to race motorcycles. The remaining Mercedes drop back as the Eiffel mist gets thicker and thicker, and the extraordinary young man in the auto union makes history. Rosemeyer's epic drive earns him a place for all time among the titans. Nuvolari is second. From now on, Rosemeyer is famous 
as the master of the mist. At Monza, Germany is without Mercedes, who are busy modifying their cars. Only the Auto Union team are here to challenge the Alphas in the Italian Grand Prix. It takes all of Rosemeyer's brilliance to hold the lead over the latest Alphas in his C-Type Auto Union, but his win makes him European champion. Nuvolari is again second and takes one of the new Alphas to America for the Vanderbilt Cup. The little Italian has never driven before on anything quite like this cross between a road and a dirt track, but he sails through the field and shows the Americans a real Grand Prix car in action. It is depressing to see the title of the French Grand Prix given to a race for sports cars. The Bugattis look large and fat, although little changed at heart. At Le Mans, this British pit stop seems to lack that Grand Prix sense of urgency. Sports car racing is, however, a shop window and can give good international racing. In the tourist trophy, the public can see and compare cars that you can actually buy. And if you want to take the family for a spin, how about one of these? Many enthusiasts build their own cars for Shelsley Walsh. All sorts can have a go. But for years, the champion is Raymond Mays. His wife, Riley, is the forerunner of the ERA. These light British racing cars, built with little help from industry or government, have a string of successes. Some 20 ERAs bring fame to such drivers as Peter Walker, Prince Bira and Pat Fairfield. The greatest of them all is the young English driver, Dick Seaman. In 1936, he wins four races with this elderly Delage, shares an Alfa Romeo to win the Donington Grand Prix and carries off the British Empire Trophy in a Maserati. Dick Seaman is a born racing driver. Mercedes have got their eye on him. The season starts with the Tripoli Grand Prix, one of the fastest races in the world. There's a new straight eight Mercedes, the W125, taking bends at around 180 miles an hour. It is a dramatic debut for one of the great cars of history and the first big win for a man who is to rank among the titans. Hermann Lang, an ex-racing mechanic wins on a W125 Mercedes at an average of 134 miles an hour. A great driver has arrived. The Berlin Arbus with its new banked turn is even faster than Tripoli. Mercedes and Auto Union have both produced fantastically streamlined bodies and the cars are reaching more than 200 on the straights. Lang wins another perfectly judged race. His average of over 162 is to make this the fastest race in the world for over 20 years. It's Dick Seaman in a Mercedes. He's in America for the Vanderbilt Cup. On the first lap, Seaman's close behind Nuvolari. On the second lap, he passes the great Italian driver and goes into the lead. But there are no certain wins for Mercedes when Rosemeyer's around. He snatches the lead on the 45th lap and holds it to the end. Most of the leading drivers aren't back in time for the Belgian Grand Prix, so the others have a turn. 
The winner is Rudolf Hasser, a newcomer to Auto Union. Mightn't you feel a bit tottery if you've just won your first Grand Prix? The German Grand Prix. Lang and Caracciola lead on the W125 Mercedes. Rosemeyer is now second. Two laps and Rosemeyer is in the lead. Four laps. Rosemeyer has a tire in shreds and the hubcap is broken. There's not a second to spare and you lose several if you can't hold your car in tight on the carousel. Nuvolari has the Alpha in third place when a tire drops him back. Caracciola's driving is as perfect as ever, and this is the way to take the carousel. Von Brachic has to be content with second place. This is Caracciola's fifth German Grand Prix victory with a Mercedes. Caracciola, Von Brachic and Rosemeyer go off together at Monaco. Hasse finds the rear engine getting in front and slows down the traffic. Caracciola leads again with Von Brachic second. extra excitement when Von Brachic takes the lead after a pit stop. He's tired of being second and in spite of team manager Neubauer he isn't making it easy for Caracciola to get past. Caracciola just makes it and then Von Brachic gets back again and stays there. For once Von Brachic takes the center of the stage with Caracciola in the wings. <laughs> Politically, Grand Prix racing is being exploited as never before. But it is the individuals who catch the public imagination. Who will ever forget Nuvolari fighting against impossible odds? There's Bernd Rosemeyer, winning the Coppa Chabo after hitting a post with a rear wheel. Alfred Neubauer, the best team manager in the world, keeping everything running smoothly. And the European champion for 1937, Rudy Caracciola in his W125 Mercedes. The last great race of the 750 kilogram formula is in England at Donington. Next year, engines will be half the size and cars are to be heavier. This is the last racing appearance of these fabulous cars with their 640 horsepower engines and dry weight of less than a ton. The Donington Grand Prix is also remembered as the last victory of the most brilliant of the Auto Union drivers. Before the next season opens, Bernd Rosemeyer is to lose his life in a record attempt. Meanwhile, track racing remains popular in America. And there's always an ambulance on the spot. At Indianapolis, Wilbur Shaw, on his Offenhauser engine special, wins at an average of over 114. Two years later, he proves this is no fluke by lapping in a Maserati at nearly 130 to win a game.
Britain also has her heroes. Among the giant cars that streak high up round Brooklands is John Cobb with his Napier Railton. Here's Sir Malcolm Campbell, the first man to reach 300. And George Easton in his eight-wheeled Thunderbird. John Cobb becomes the first man to travel at over 350 in 1938. This is the year of the new Grand Prix formula, which limits blown engines to three litres with a minimum weight of 850 kilos. The new Mercedes are lower, more streamlined cars with V12 engines that are so highly supercharged that they produce 400 horsepower. Their first big race is the politically important Tripoli Grand Prix, with its millions of lira in prizes. The Italians have four new Alfa Romeos, but Mercedes have been limited to three cars, with Caracciola, von Brauchitsch and Lang. The organizers have made up the field for a state lottery by adding prizes for voiturettes. There are many of these slower but successful one and a half liter Italian cars. Today, the three liter Mercedes prove astonishingly little slower than last year's cars. Improved road holding making up for the drop in power and they're averaging around 130. Caracciola shows signs of the strain and an old injury to his leg is paining him. But the new Italian cars are in greater trouble. The Mercedes respond well to the new technique of using the throttle to steer them round bends. Fuel consumption is tremendous. And it's not easy putting in 50 gallons in a matter of seconds. This is methyl alcohol with nitrobenzol and acetone. Herman Lang drives a perfectly judged race, leading the other Mercedes by five minutes. The ex-mechanic is greeted by his own band of supporters. France is the setting for the French Grand Prix, and there's no sports car nonsense. It's the real thing. Mercedes have it all their own way. It's Hasser again on his first lap, and the French cars are also in trouble. Von Brachic averages over a hundred to win and gives the French crowd a disturbing demonstration of German supremacy. The German Grand Prix, again on the Nürburgring, is the most important race of the year. Dick Seaman is getting his first drive of the season. Mercedes have entered four cars. Auto Union also have four cars, and they persuaded Nuvolari to join them. The start of the race of the year, and the green light doesn't work. 
they're off to a straggling start. It's Lang, Nuvolari, Seaman. Lang is pulling ahead, but Seaman is on Nuvolari's tail. Seaman is second. See how the Mercedes drivers use their power in the curves. They're first, second, third and fourth. Nuvolari has gone off the road on the first lap. As Lang's engine goes woolly, Seaman takes the lead. The young Englishman has set a lap record for this new formula and is in the lead when he comes in to refuel. Neubauer is worried. Caracciola is feeling sick. The ambitious von Brauchitsch is out to win again, and he really gets motoring. It's Lang taking over Caracciola's car. Nuvolari is also kicking his heels in the pits when young Muller, with true chivalry, offers his auto union to the maestro. Markic is now in the lead with Seaman close behind. There's another hundred miles to go when von Brakic comes in for a last pit stop with Seaman only 15 seconds behind. Brokic's car is on fire, and there's some 80 gallons of fuel on board. Dick Seaman is taking the lead. Lang is in second place, but von Brokic hasn't given up. Seaman drives perfectly, three minutes ahead of anyone else, earning his place among the Titans. Von Brakic returns to the pits, but his steering wheel hasn't got a car fixed to it any longer. Lang is second, Von Stuck third. Even in this year of international tension, the crowd are quick to show their appreciation of the English driver's victory. This is the first time for 15 years that an Englishman has won a major Grand Prix. It is real Caracciola weather when it rains for the Swiss Grand Prix. it is Seaman in the lead. But when it rains harder and harder, no one can equal Caracciola.
Ratiola wins and is hailed as European champion. The Italian Grand Prix at Monza. Nuvolari has now discovered how to keep his auto union on the road and he outdrives everyone else. The pace is tremendous as every record is broken and Nuvolari wins at an average of over 96. The Munich crisis has postponed the Donington Grand Prix, but they're all here. Nuvolari again shows that given half a chance he can outdrive anyone. The race is nearly halfway through when disaster strikes. There's oil on the track and it's Hasse. It's Dick Seaman who was in third place. Here's Balmer. But the one who is affected least of all is Nuvolari. He goes on to win the last Donington Grand Prix. The Italians counter Germany by limiting all their races to one and a half litre cars. Marshal Balbo is confident that his Tripoli Grand Prix will go to one of the highly successful little Alphas or Maseratis. But there's a familiar figure embarking from Europe. In complete secrecy, Mercedes have produced two entirely new one-and-a-half-litre cars. The little Mercedes even have a lead over Marshal Balbo's flag. The German cars become legendary. They are easily the fastest, and yet they have never been seen before and are never to race again. Lang wins the Tripoli Grand Prix for the third time. Lang has a two-stage blower on his three-litre Mercedes and laps the Nürburgring ring faster than ever before to win the Eiffel Rennen. He is on his way to become this year's European champion. Moreover, when it rains for the Belgian Grand Prix, he is to beat Caracciola, who crashes. It is a grey and treacherous day and a heartbroken Lang who wins. For Dick Seaman crashed to his death. The 1939 German Grand Prix is also held on a drizzling wet day. It is Lang diving in front with von Brakic on his tail. The swastikas fly in the heavy air and the Graf Zeppelin circles overhead, looking down on the last German Grand Prix for more than a decade. The race is dogged with mechanical failures. Lang finds his engine rough and Nuvolari also has trouble, while it rains harder and harder. It is, however, a fitting end, for it is Caracciola who once again takes the lead perhaps the greatest of all the Titans. For the sixth time, Caracciola wins the German Grand Prix on a Mercedes. His last victory on the Nürburgring, and indeed, in any major international event. A quarter of a century has passed. Alfred Neubauer is back at the Nürburgring with Hermann Lang and what is still the most powerful road racing car ever built, the 1937 Grand Prix Mercedes. The cars and the drivers change, but motor racing will always be one of the great testing grounds of engineering skill and human courage. We salute the great drivers of the past as we drive a final lap of the Nürburgring with one of the last of the Titans.